Hi everyone, I am here at the JMIR Publications Headquarters on Queen's Quay in Toronto. Join with me today is Gunther Eisenbach. He's the founder, CEO, and executive editor of JMIR Publications. Hi Gunther, thanks for sitting with me today. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. So we are here today because 2024 is the 25th anniversary of the founding of JMIR Publications. To celebrate, we will be conducting a series of interviews with various stakeholders and key members of the open science community who have contributed to this milestone. To kick off this series, I'd like to ask you a few questions, Gunther. So to start off, reflecting on 25 years, what inspired you to start an open access digital health journal? Yeah, so the Journal of Medical Internet Research was founded 25 years ago. JMRR publications as a company actually came a bit later. Um, but the Journal of Medical Internet Research was the original journal, which I back then created as a more like a side project when I was still full time with the university as a professor. Um, so it was really a labor of love. And um, things that drove me to creating a journal was um, First of all, I, mean, I always had an interest in publishing already when I was a medical student. I was uh, working for a major publisher uh, as an editor. So I had this background from the scholarly publishing industry. I also always had a passion for uh, information science, computer science, and I was not only studying medicine, but also computer science on the side. So when the internet emerged in the mid 90s, I was all over it. It was right down my alley. And, um, and I recognized the enormous implications of the internet in medicine, the change um, that is created by uh, like making information accessible and not only to the experts or the medical professionals, but also to consumers. So that was one motivation. The, the content uh, motivation. There was no other journal back then that covered that. Um, and there were medical informatics journals out there, but um, they were all very much focused on what we now call clinical informatics, which is uh, the clinical information in hospital systems and, and, and uh, ambulatory care uh, systems. So none of these journals were actually covering the other side of medical informatics that was kind of enabled through the internet, which is the consumer facing aspect of it and uh, making medical informatics really mainstream. So the content was one, the other driving factor was I wanted to innovate in terms of form, like how to run a journal, how to publish a journal. Uh, as I said, I was familiar with the publishing industry. And uh, back then in the late 90s, many journals were still only available in print. Many had begun a, a, a shift to publishing online as well. Uh, but also many of the editorial processes in the editor office were still paper-based. Like I remember having to print out 10 copies of my manuscript and, and sending it by mail to a editorial office where those 10 copies would be distributed on paper to the peer viewers. Right? So that was kind of the end of the 90s. It's, it seems like uh, this is kind of a, it was a different age back then. So we wanted to innovate. I thought there must be a better way of publishing a journal. So it was from the beginning, all electronic only, open access and all processes really optimized for the internet. So communications through email only and so on. And back then that was still kind of a relatively new thing to do. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like you've seen a lot of change and transformation over the years. So I'm curious to know um, how the landscape of medical research and technology has evolved since the inception of JMIR publications. Yeah, I mean, so the field where focusing on what is now called digital health um, went indeed through a lot of changes, starting with the name, like, I mean, the term digital health is also 
uh, relatively new, uh, but uh, we have been doing the same work or we have published the same work under different names over the years. Initially, for example, we were talking about cyber medicine, which was inspired by a book uh, that was published by Warner Slack with the title Cyber Medicine. Um, then we talked about e-health and helped to define what e-health means electronic health. I published an editorial where I also came up with the 10 meanings of the E in the word e-health. So it's not only electronic, but also empowerment, for example, and, and other E's that kind of characterize what, what e-health is all about. And then we shifted the, the terminology to digital health or digital medicine, which is the term that is currently on book, but this may also change in the next 25 years again to a different term. Mm -hmm. So it's really now an accepted area of research that was not the case back then when we started. Um, the research itself has become much more rigorous back then, for example, there were no randomized controlled trials to evaluate internet-based interventions. So that came much later and um, we certainly helped to define the field and also to insist on rigor in kind of evaluating those kind of interventions. Yeah, you mentioned that you've sort of helped to define the field. So I'd love to learn more about how the innovations that you developed have helped adapt to or even inspire some of these changes. Yeah, so as I said, I was always interested in innovating also in terms of form and how we publish. And we were always an early adopter uh, in terms of adopting new internet-based technologies. For example, when social media came up, so some people may have forgotten that social media were not there right from the beginning of the internet in 1999. There was no social media. There were like bulletin board systems and, and, and news message boards, perhaps. So that's perhaps the closest thing to social media. but. Facebook only came in 2004 and mm -hmm. Twitter came in 2006. So, and we were always very early adopters in using those technologies, both in terms of knowledge dissemination. So we were probably the first publisher who like automatically tweeted about every article that we publish. And we were probably also the first publisher who looked at using social media to obtain novel kind of metrics on the impact of mm -hmm. research. So we have like from the beginning collected tweets about our published papers. We call those tweetations, so citations in a tweet to a existing JMIR paper. Uh, we have like systematically collected those uh, data. And um, that was long before old metrics became a term, right? Old metrics now is, yeah. is, is a known approach to gather other metrics beyond citation metrics from primarily from social media. And we have implemented this very early and we have, I've written a paper in 2011 about the correlation between tweetations, so early tweets and later citations, which surprisingly showed that there was some correlation here. So you can actually use the number of times an article is tweeted as an early predictor for like saying this may also be a very well cited paper right. two years later. So yeah, I think we have been a pioneer in that. Um, beyond social media, um, I'm also the co-founder of another company which is called TrendMD. I'm no longer involved in that company, but I helped start that company and uh, what we had developed here is a kind of a cross publisher recommendation platform. So when you go to a JMIR paper or actually also many papers published by other publishers, you see a little box underneath the, the, the paper that recommends similar papers and those similar papers may come from the same publisher or may also come from another publisher. So this kind of recommendation tool is something that was conceived and pilot tested within JMRR mm -hmm. journals. 
And we have subsequently also done a randomized trial to measure the impact of this tool on how often a paper is cited. And we have shown that increased visibility through this tool. In other words, if you, if you advertise a paper through TrendMD, you can actually increase the number of citations a paper attracts. That's something that like many people have disputed. There was always this argument, visibility does not lead to more citations. And, um, but we have shown very conclusively that more visibility can lead to more citations. And um, we have done that in that, in the TrendMD study, I've also done this in, in another study that was published in PLOS Biology, not about JMR papers, but about papers published in PNAS, where I also showed that kind of open access advantage. That's very interesting. Uh, can you share a memorable success story or breakthrough moment from the past 25 years that highlights the impact of JMIR publications in the medical research field? Yeah, well, I mean, the COVID years were really a turning point for us, um, not only because like everything we've been doing before and all the work on digital health that we published before was kind of validated through the COVID pandemic because suddenly digital health became or had to become mainstream right? when, yeah. not, when people couldn't go to the doctor's office anymore guess what suddenly telemedicine became a thing and became like widely adopted it was kind of a moment we were all waiting for but it was a very um, very defining moment I think for digital health and that has really propelled medicine into the next like digital era. Uh, it's a shame that it, it took a pandemic to, to be the catalyst for that, but um, that is certainly something that has helped the field. At the same time, that uh, led also to a very significant um, increase in submissions mm -hmm. and uh, help the company to grow so we had to fortunately we were moving to new offices uh, we're sitting here in, in, in our newish office that we moved into in in 2020 shortly before the pandemic so um, that was a defining moment for the company as well because it helped us to scale up and become a multi-journal company yeah, I mean, the company was incorporated in 2011 and we had started in 2011 to create sister journals, um, including, for example, JMRR, Public Health and Surveillance, which also took off a little bit of help yeah. <laughs> from the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, the other success story, I think, is that field of infidemiology. Um, that, that is a term that I, that I coined um, at the end of the 90s as well um, to characterize the science of misinformation on the internet. So that always was kind of a standing topic in the Journal of Medical Internet Research and also in other journals. Um, but it became really a accepted line of research um, during the pandemic uh, when WHO declared that infodemiology or tackling the infodemic is a important pillar in fighting the pandemic. In other words, a lot of misinformation on the internet doesn't really help to kind of get the right public health messages out. So this kind of developed into a discipline that is more or less recognized by WHO as a scientific discipline. And we have subsequently also JMIR infodemiology, which is focusing on that research topic. Oh, that's great. I mean, it's always refreshing hearing positive things that came out of that time. Um, so switching gears a little, in the fast-paced world of technology, uh, what strategies have you used over the years to keep the organization competitive and innovative? Well, I mean, 
I am a user and lover of technology myself. So I try to use technology whenever possible. I try to automate things. And this is something that I'm trying to instill in the culture of this company as well, that mm -hmm. people like use technology uh, and including now artificial intelligence, for example, yeah. encourage everybody to use AI in, in their daily work um, within obviously boundaries of what makes sense. But yeah, so using technology ourselves at the same time, I'm also still an academic. I still have an adjunct professorship at the University of Victoria. So, and many of my colleagues here at the at, at the uh, publisher JMR Publications have a similar background, an academic background. So we kind of see the publishing industry through that lens of an academic who needs to publish. So, and that has also, I think, helped to make our company very customer friendly and mm -hmm. I'm very proud of the fact that we have over 1500 reviews now on google and the average rating is five stars which is kind of unheard of <laughs> because yeah. uh, five stars in maximum rating so if you have an average rating of five stars that means like basically everybody is highly satisfied with our with the support they're getting and uh, i'm very proud of that fact. Yeah, that's excellent. So we've been talking a lot about how things have evolved, but I would like to take things uh, back to the beginning to the vision statement. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are sitting in the headquarters right now. And to my left, we have the vision statement up on the wall. And it begins with envisioning a world where people are empowered by health research and technology. Um, I'd just like to learn a little more about what inspired that vision. Yeah, so this vision statement came later. Uh, it was not formulated in the, in the early days, but I was very inspired by the uh, participatory medicine movement that also emerged in the mid 90s, largely through a, a, a very influential doctor. Um, his name was Tom Ferguson, uh, who was a patient himself. He yeah, also had cancer and ultimately succumbed uh, to cancer. Um, but he was, uh, he was one of the proponents of this new model that patients really should be more involved in, in their care. And to be more involved, what it takes, among other things, is information, to have the information to act on. Because of all the information about yourself, like you need to have access to your health records and need to know what's going on with you and also access to external information, to the evidence base. And that was one of the reasons why the Journal of Medical Internet Research and all the other journals were always open access from the beginning uh, with, this, with the reasoning that you know, it shouldn't be only health professionals who have access to a library who uh, should be able to read that information, and act on that information. So that aspect of consumer empowerment, which is one of the 10 E's of e-health, um, that was always like, basically a founding principle of this company. And we, we still support this movement by publishing the Journal of Participatory Medicine, which is published by Society of Participatory Medicine. It used to be self-published, but now we have taken over that journal a couple of years ago as, as a publisher. And uh, because we want to promote that field of research as well. Yeah, that's great. So as we all know, every endeavor comes with its own set of challenges. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you've faced as a founder in the scholarly publishing industry? Oh yeah, it's it's not easy for a new publisher to enter the publishing market. Um, one of the big barriers here is that, um, for example, indexing services uh, are very conservative and slow when it comes to indexing new journals, and that is still the case today. For example, Scopus doesn't even look at a 
journal until it's two years old, um, which doesn't exactly help uh, like the the promotion of, of new emerging knowledge and new emerging research fields. For example, like we have new technologies emerging all the time. Right now it's, for example, extended reality that everybody's talking about. So we created a new journal, the MIR, XR and spatial computing. And um, at, again, it's going to take at least two years until it's in Scopus. It will take a couple of years until it has an impact factor. So it's these kind of dynamics in the broader scholarly ecosystem that make it actually quite difficult to launch new journals. Um, but we have done this successfully with over 30 journals now. And finally, most of them have an impact factor now. It just took much longer than I would have hoped for. The other aspect is that the scholarly ecosystem itself is constantly changing. And especially in the last couple of years, uh, with open access really becoming mainstream now, we have to uh, react to this as well and um, like ask ourselves, what's our value proposition beyond offering open access? Because we're not we are no longer alone with offering that option, um, mm -hmm. but we are still the only publisher who like fo has a very big focus on digital health. Even though we are also now publishing journals that have absolutely nothing to do with digital health, but digital health remains our focus, and I think that is a big advantage for our authors as well, because they know that there is. There are qualified editors who have seen digital health papers before, and um, it's also an advantage in terms of uh, our cascading peer review system. So if mm -hmm. a paper is not accepted by our flagship journal uh, or one of our flagship journals, um, then the peer review can be reused. We have this portable, portable peer review system where the paper can be transferred to another journal in the JMIR portfolio and can be published by, by a different journal without the author losing too much time sending in a new submission. That's great. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like you've been very successful in overcoming these challenges, but I think speaking of success, one of the key components to a successful organization is the, the company and the people who work for you. So. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your company culture and how you think that the company culture has contributed to the longevity and success that you've seen. Yeah, I want to say JMRR is, is a very mission-driven company and mission-driven publisher in a sense that many of our employees are former academics mm -hmm. or have research degrees, so they really know what they're talking about. And they are working with us because they also have a sense that scholarly publishing must change and they want to be a part of that change. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like you have an organization that really cares and is passionate about the work you're doing, which is very important. So now coming off of your first 25 years of success in the space, I think it'd be really valuable if you could share some advice for aspiring entrepreneurs also looking to enter into the scholarly publishing space. So um, based on your experience and learnings in the past 25 years, do you have anything you could share? Well, I would say the number one is perseverance. And it is a very difficult industry to enter mm -hmm. if you're an innovator. If you're an innovator, by the way, working on some sort of a scholarly publishing innovation, I would love you to talk with us because <laughs> we want to know about that and, and we may uh, partner with you. Yeah, other than that, I would recommend um, persevere and believe in what you're doing and success is certainly not guaranteed, but um, it makes it so much easier if you work on something that you believe in. Of course. And then uh, switching to your executive editor hat, uh, what advice would you give to a researcher or a prospective author looking to get published? Well, um, maybe don't overthink it. Just mm -hmm. submit your manuscript. Uh, we have very little or actually no formatting requirement, hard formatting requirement for the initial submission. And um, we 
have also this system of cascading peer review. So even if you aim high and submit your paper to our flagship journal, which is still the Journal of Medical Internet Research, mm -hmm. or JMIR, Public Health and Surveillance, um, if it's rejected from that journal, we will cascade it to another journal if, if the author wants it. Um, so that makes it perhaps a little bit easier to pull the trigger and submit something. Because in my experience, the hardest part is if you don't have any external deadline, you just mm -hmm. keep working on the paper and keep working and it's just ne never finished because it doesn't exist, This the perfect paper, right? So <laughs> it takes a little bit of self-discipline to say, okay, this is my deadline. On that deadline, I'm going to send it out yeah. and wait for the peer review comments and then use that as a basis to to work on the paper. That's great to hear. How would you say JMIR Publications has contributed to the broader scientific and medical community? And what initiatives or projects are you most proud of? Well, I'm proud of how we really coined certain terms and entire disciplines, for example, epidemiology yeah. as a discipline. Uh, I'm also proud that we helped fostering digital health research by like offering highly ranked journals. Um, I think many people wouldn't even embark on a line of research if they wouldn't know that there is an outlet there and a, a respected outlet to disseminate their work and that this will also count towards their career goals, be it getting a PhD or tenure and promotion if you're a professor. Um, and we have also, I think, uh, published a couple of very important guidelines for digital health researchers on how to publish their work. So there are guidelines, for example, Consort eHealth, which mm -hmm. is like an extension of the consort statement on how to report randomized controlled trials in the field. There's a CHERRIES statement that is also a very high, highly cited guideline on how to report the results of electronic surveys. We have basically also through one seminal paper that we published about e-health literacy. It's the e-health instrument that was published in our journal that really has opened up the, the research around e-health literacy, so how to, how to train people to, for example, detect misinformation on the internet, which right. I think is a very important pillar of infodemiology. It's, it's addressing the source problem, but also like teaching people how to filter the information which is out there. So that's kind of a line of research that was really also, where we have published a lot of papers about in our e-collection on e-health literacy and the uh, seminal paper by Norman and Skinner on the e-health instrument, which, which was published in the Dawn of Medical Internet Research, mm -hmm. really opened up that area of research. That's great. Yeah, this has been a very insightful conversation. But before we go, I do have one final question for you. Uh, the scholarly publishing industry has changed significantly over the last you know, three to four years. So I'm curious to hear how you envision the future of the publishing world. For the next couple of years, I think scholarly publishing will have changed in 25 years, or maybe it takes 100 years, but there will be a change. And I think the main change will be that this, this journal metaphor, I mean, in practice, no journal is actually a journal anymore in, in, in a sense of being a printed product or what you associate with the name journal, right? And mm -hmm. Everything has moved. Uh, to an electronic medium, I think that will also continue to evolve. So I see journals really more as communities, communities of people who are interested in a very specific field. And I think in the longer term, these communities will only exist on the internet. Right? There will be electronic communities that do a rapid peer view or voting on a preprint. So that whole notion of preprint service, that's also something that has, at least in medicine, only ex 
exploded in the last couple of years. Also, uh, COVID being a major catalyst because people didn't have the time anymore to wait for journals to do rigorous peer review. Right. So it was often seen as a better solution to first put a preprint out. But then the problem is the lack of peer review of mm -hmm. preprint. And that's all the P's that are in Plan P. So the P in Plan P stands for preprints. I think preprints are great, but it, any preprint should be followed by a rapid peer review by a community. So we call these communities hashtag communities because our idea is that a preprint author could put a hashtag into the preprint and then that way it will be routed to that peer review community who could peer view uh, the, the preprint. And that community could be a journal club, like a preprint journal club. It could be an existing editorial board. It could be a society. Uh, it could be any group of researchers who is just interested in a very, very uh, small sub topic uh, in, a, in a scientific discipline. So we envision a model where that becomes standard, that uh, most researchers publish their work initially as a preprint. Mm -hmm. It will be routed to a peer review community. Peer review community perhaps makes a quick vote on whether that paper deserves a more in-depth peer review. And then the peer review will be initiated by, by a journal. Um, so another innovation, which we actually started five years ago, and that was announced in our 20th anniversary theme issue mm -hmm. is the Jamie X series of journals, which uh, employs an entirely new model of peer view, which some people call PRC. Uh, it means first publish as a preprint, then review, and then curate in a journal. So that is embodied by the Jamie X series of journals. and um, other publishers, for example, eLife has started doing that as well. Um, our model is a little bit different and doesn't attract the same level of criticism that the eLife model, for example, has uh, seen because we are actually not, we are not promising any publication. We are not publishing everything that we peer review. So briefly, the Jamie X model or the overlay journal model, or we also call it super journals, um, or the PRC model is basically all the same. The idea is that authors first publish as a preprint, then we peer review it, or we employ kind of a third party trusted community to peer review the preprint, and uh, then we publish it or curate it in one of our journals according to uh, impact it may be either published in a Jamie X journal or. It may go on our internal manuscript marketplace uh, so that other journals from the Jamie series uh, can snatch it up and publish it. Wow, sounds like there's a lot of exciting innovations on the horizon for JMIR publications. Um, I guess on that note, that's all the questions I have for you today, Gunther. I appreciate you sitting down with me and congratulations again on 25 years. Sounds like the next 25 years are going to be equally, if not more exciting. So um, yeah, uh, congratulations and thank you.